We are in the path of the just, chapter 20. We're using the art scroll um, version. It's called the Jaffa edition, if you're interested in purchasing it. We're in chapter 20. We only have just a couple of more chapters left. I think 26 chapters total. So we have about six more chapters. That should be about another year. We'll be in this book. <laughs> so um, this, the, uh, the, the title of this chapter is basically weighing the implications or, uh, or weighing the uh, implications or implementation of chesedus or piety. Now, this word, um, meshekel, is an interesting word that is used. Meshekel just means basically weight, to weigh. But it's more than just weighing. It's, it's more than just averaging something out. What we're going to learn here is that uh, the Ramchal says, based on the previous chapters of uh, bringing down all of the methods on how to become a righteous, saintly person. I want to now deal with in a chapter of the implications of how you approach this, making sure that you weigh every detail. So here, here is a good illustration given to me by a dear friend of mine in, um, in, um, in New York. I called him this morning to talk about the word mesheko. Uh, because I knew there was something more than just weigh, weigh the implications, uh, implementation. Um, the, it would be like going to a doctor, and the doctor is going to give you a body mass uh, index thing, and you see how, how fat you are. So this first one, you get on the scale, you get on the scale, and you get finished, he says, okay, you're approximately 10 pounds, 20 pounds, 50 pounds overweight. Uh, and it, you really need to lose the weight. It's my suggestion, you know, uh, cut back on the amount of food. And he gives you a, a dietary line. But you go home and you say, you know what? Now, I've thought about this, and losing weight is very important. So no sugar, no starches. I'm totally cutting out processed foods, period. That's it, none. That's it. But you've weighed the implications or implementation. You've thought about how you're going to implement this thing. You really thought about it, but you're going to go above what the doctor says you're going to need to do. But you need to weigh the challenge of it because some people make decisions like that that have not been thought through properly. They haven't weighed the, 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 the whole idea of it. They make these decisions and then five weeks into it, they're completely fallen away. They've not been able to complete the, the dietary restrictions and they get discouraged. Next thing, they've gained five more pounds because you know, they're eating Twinkies on the couch and watching TV instead of cycling, something that sounds like I do. But anyway. Um, Let's go. He says, in weighing the implementation of chesedus or piety, he says, after in defining chesedus in chapter 18 through 19, uh, we must clarify now this idea of weighing the pr priority of chesedus in situations where it may compete with our values or whether uh, or different elements of other parts of righteousness may compete with each other. Now, this is going to be a little cloudy at first, but as the Ramchal goes through, we're going to see. Well, what he's saying here right off the bat is this whole weighing idea is carefully examining what you're going to do so that it doesn't affect something that you should be doing. It's something that's expected of you to do as a righteous person. If you're going to raise the ante up in your level of righteousness, make sure it's not going to be competing against the other things that you do. We'll, he'll explain it in a, in a moment. He says, Know with certainty that this is the most difficult task to practice in piety or chesedus, for it is very subtle, and as such the evil inclination has significantly uh, has a significant in entry in this matter. Therefore, the risk of an erroneous uh, weighing of chesedus is enormous. For the evil inclination can convince someone to reject many good practices as though they are bad ones and embrace many sins as though they were mitzvahs as well as the illustration below. So we have an illustration that he comes 
from uh, this. It says, thus, instead of tempting a person to sin outright, the Yetzirah Hara, drives him to think he is being even more righteous than the Halakha requires, considering the uh, aspiring Chesed's lofty level. This is the only tactic which, with which the Yetzirah can ensnare him. For it knows that an individual who has refined himself so much that he has purged every negative trait and physical desire for himself will not be receptive to ordinary enticements. So here, here's the example. Uh, a, a, a pious individual who's not tempted in his um, um, sexual temptations. He's just not tempted. He's up to such a level. It's just not, it doesn't even come over as any type of temptation at all. Never even crosses his mind. Doesn't contemplate. Come on in and make yourself comfortable, please. Can you guys make a place for it, please? So a person that is not tempted in any way goes to, and he says, look, since I'm not tempted, I'm not bothered by, by, uh, by any type of lust in my life, it would be okay for me to go to uh, a beach and hang out where there's a lot of nudity. It would be okay because I'm not tempted. Do you see the problem here? The problem is, is though he may not be tempted to sin, could very well be committing a sin by doing something that he shouldn't be doing. That's what they're talking about. So it's talking about weighing out the implications or the, the implementation of what you're going to do. It's very important. So let's go on. He says, the chesed must be, and the chesed for uh, description purposes, is a, a righteous person who's very pious, very religious, very, very godly, must take three necessary steps to avoid this pitfall that we just were talking about. In truth, a person cannot succeed in this weighing of chesedus unless he meets three requirements. So let's look at the three. First, his heart must be the most sincere of hearts, such that his sole motivation is to bring satisfaction to God Blessed be he, and nothing else whatsoever. So, the first one, his motives has to be utmost of purity before making the decision to add something to himself that is not required. You, I mean, you have to have the purest of intention. Because we talked about this in earlier chapters. A person that says, for example, this is what the, this is what, uh, the, the Torah law says I must do, but I'm going to add more restrictions on myself. Well, if he does not have the purest of heart, it might be, he might be doing these things for pride issues. He might be doing them to try to get people to say, oh, wow, what a really great guy. All right? So that is the reason why. Second, this individual must scrutinize his actions very thoroughly and endeavor to perfect them in accordance with his goal of bringing satisfaction to God. Remember, everything we do is for the satisfaction of heaven. Right? Everything is for the sake of heaven. Number three, after all this has been done, number one, uh, having a sincere heart. Number two, scrutinizing your actions, making sure that they're for the sake of heaven. The third one is he should cast his burden upon God. For then it can be said, which is found in Psalm 84, 6, praiseworthy is the man whose strength is in you, O Lord. Those whose hearts focus on upward paths regard such a person who has done his utmost to ensure that his actions are worthy and then places his trust in God. It is stated further in Psalms, also in, in, in verse 12 of the same chapter, Hashem will not withhold goodness from those who walk in wholeness, which is faith. He will surely help them achieve proper balance to be a righteous individual. So this idea that a person really stakes his life on making sure that he does everything to the utmost. I'm reminded of pilots, people who fly aircraft, especially fighter pilots, but any kind of pilot. There's an extensive checklist that you have to go through before you fly. It's a pre-flight checklist. And you go through and, I mean, it's, it's mind-numbing check that you have to go through, especially if you're a private pilot and you don't have a team of technicians that come around and check, you have to check 
the water and the fuel, you have to make sure the tires are aired up properly, there's no damage to the tires. You have to make sure that all of the, the ailerons and, and the flaps are working properly. It's, it's pretty extensive. Why? Because he's weighing the implementation of flying that aircraft. So a righteous person, before he says, you know what, I'm, I'm a godly person, but I, I want to raise up the ante. I, I just don't want to be accepted. I want to really please God. I want to please God to the highest level. Then it's going to require him to really measure out how he does that. Rabbi Moshe Hamlazato warns of the risk of attempting to practice righteousness or pure piety without adhering to these guidelines that he just posted. However, if someone lacks even one of these requirements, he will not arrive at that true place of what Psalms called a wholesome faith, that complete package of purity before God. On the contrast, what it seems that an individual, if he lacks attention to detail, if he doesn't have the purest of motives, if he is not scrutinizing his action, and if he's not doing everything for the sake of pleasing God, then he's going to likely stumble and fall. In other words, either if his intention is not the most choice or pure, according to the Ramchal, he has other motives aside from being satisfaction to a shim, or if he has neg uh, uh, negligent and scrutinizes and uh, conduct it, uh, to the best of his ability, or after com uh, complying with all of these, he does not place his trust in God, it will be difficult for him not to fall. It's almost guaranteed to fall. Why? Because a person who's a pious individual, and we're not just talking about a good, great person who's a religious person. We're talking about somebody's a chesedut, right? highly righteous person. Anyone attempting to practice that kind of lifestyle without weighing it and without having the proper motives is doomed to failure. Here's an example, practical example. Uh, I, I, liked, I used to like to mountain bike with the, with the boys. But I'm 52 years old and I recognize my limitations and balance and agility. I would love to get on a mountain bike again and ride. But my mountain biking riding now is not going to be what it was when I was in my 30s. Right? When I was in the 30s, I would go up hills, jump ramps, go on edges and ledges where you could fall off and hurt yourself, all for the adrenaline. But at 52 years old, I would be a fool to get on a mountain bike and go, you know, go up in, in the hill country riding a, a mountain bike. It'd, be, it'd just be crazy. And if, if I didn't really pay close attention to detail and ask myself, well, what's, what's my motivation behind it? Why am I actually doing this? Um, am I really scrutinizing my actions and based on this? I'm destined to become a failure and probably never get back up on the bike after I have my first major incident, correct? So the whole goal is the Ramchal says, here we've elucidated all of these great concepts to become a righteous individual. But before you do it, stop, pause, take a breath, and realize you got to weigh how you implement this. Does it mean he doesn't, he's not saying he doesn't want you to implement it. He's not saying you shouldn't implement it. He's wanting you to weigh, weigh the issues and think about it. So just as I will weigh the issues before I get on my son-in-law's mountain bike to test it out in a few days, I will think about what I'm wearing, what time of day, and where I'm going to cycle that thing. Very simple. I'm going to keep it on the roads. It's flat. I don't have to jump curbs, and I don't have to do all that, right? I'm going to be. I'm going to look like what was the name of the uh, Disney thing? The lady Mary Poppins, <laughs> all right? And I'll be riding the big Mary Poppins bike. Now I'm not going to be even can I'll be Mary Poppins. So I'll measure it out, and you'll see me with the rubber bands around my pants legs, and me whistling a song, and not really exhilarating myself very much. But hopefully, in due time. I'll get to where at least I'll have confidence to ride on sidewalks, off sidewalks, in the grass. Okay, and if I can reach a higher level, I will do that only because I've achieved the lower ones at the best of my ability. So, this should not discourage a, a, a pious individual. A person truly wanting to reach the highest level is not going to get discouraged by these words. They're actually going to be encouraged by the words. But if 
that person adheres to all three of these requirements, that is purity of intent or motivation, scrutiny of his actions, and finally trust of God, he can proceed with true confidence that no evil will befall him. Meaning that if you do those things, you can be guaranteed this one thing. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek them. He rewards you. It, just, it, it might seem way over your head, but he will reward you for what you can do, and he will assist you. He will bring you up to higher levels. So, it is regarding this matter that, uh, that Hana said in, in uh, Eve said in her prophecy, uh, in, in her prophecy, which is uh, brought down in, not Eve, I'm sorry, Hana, in 1 Samuel 2 9, says this Hashem guards the steps of his devout ones. God guards the steps of devout ones. And David Hamelik similarly says in Psalm 37 28, he does not forsake his devout ones, they will be eternally protected. As both these verses affirm, God protects the devout individuals from stumbling on the, de de uh, the delicate path of righteousness so that one can maintain a pleasant balance and a degree of their piety. So if one goes very simply and easily into this thing, doing one level at the best they can at a time, in due time you'll get there. Now, one thing that is uh, pretty much known, could you hit that other light in the back for me? Um, which is known within the Orthodox Jewish community. Anybody coming to what they call Bali Tshuva, to return back to their Jewish practices of, of, of Orthodox Judaism. They are, they are highly encouraged not to do too much. Um, they don't want some guy who's basically lived his, most of his life in, in a secular, as a secular Jew to um, go out immediately and buy a stremel, a, you know, the fur hat, and a long black coat, and seat seats that ride on the ground. and they, they don't want you to do all that. Because first of all, if you do all that and you do fail, which we are going to have failures, we're going to try to be righteous and have failures, they don't want it to be such a long, hard fall that he's not able to recover, or maybe he recovers, but he causes somebody else to fall, right? Uh, it's, it's about, and I love what Rabbi Wobi says from Torch, um, if you're going to do Shabbos, start with one light switch at a time. Right? Don't try to do everything, just one, one little thing. Master that and you'll do well. How does one assess whether an act of, of piety is actually desirable? And how do you assess whether this next thing it would be desirable? So let's think for a moment. Something that is not required that is found in Scripture, that you are going to put on yourself a restriction. It's not found anywhere in the Tanakh as a Torah law. Can you think of one thing that would be a, a, a pious thing, a really righteous thing to do, but it's not in Scripture? Maybe to read Psalms or you know, to take a Psalm or read it daily. I don't think it says, I don't know if it says anywhere in Scripture that you have to mm -hmm. open up the book of Psalms and read a Psalm, but if that's something you want to achieve to do to become more knowledgeable, right. would that be an example? That would be an example. That would be a good example. Uh, another example is we're told uh, that if we want to understand being a righteous person and living righteously, read this book 101 times. Study it 101 times. Now, that's a restriction. Are you adding something that's not really required? Uh, you have to be practical about how you approach things. And you're going to ask yourself, now, reading a psalm a day is not too hard. But let's think of something a little bit more really hard, something really big. Something to be difficult due to your social environment, whatever. Can you think of something else? Keeping kosher, keeping kosher is difficult because, you know, you um, don't want to offend someone, say, for mm -hmm. instance, if you, you know, are over at their home. Right, 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 they, right. And they okay. themselves out in, in something. Let's take, let's take that on. That's a good one. Okay. So let's say uh, you're not in Jewish community. You're not a Jew, but you want to keep kosher. You want to live a kosher you know, life. You want to keep kosher as best, best possible. But it's difficult because uh, family and friends, they won't understand why don't you want to eat my food that I fixed. Right? And that's, that would be a difficult one. So um, with that in mind, 
you have to you have to take into account what that's going to cost you and whether you can do it not whether you want to do it it's not about your intent because your intent would be to please god you you would scrutinize how you would do it but you have to count the cost of what it's going to cost you within your family circles knowing that you're not a jew why are you practicing kosher when you don't have to why are you putting these restrictions on yourself and so it has to be something that is is really assessed how do you know if it's desirable i'm sorry go ahead. I don't know if this really fits in with this, but it reminded me of a story Rabbi Greenbaum told us about another rabbi who went to a home and the, the lady was preparing fish, and the way she was cooking yes. all that, he just couldn't bring himself to eat right. it. It was disgusting. So right. when she served it, he said, I'm sorry, I don't eat fish. And from that, even though he loved fish, from that point on, he never ate fish again. Right. So he would be telling her the truth. Right. So that is, that is what a pious, righteous person would do. So not to ever lie, not to ever make a sin, I'll just not eat fish again for the rest of my life. Now, most, most of us would go, oh, that's a little ridiculous, right? But that is the kind of piety, that's the kind of righteousness that we're talking about. So how do we assess, go, go ahead, you need to uh, there, There's a, in the Jewish ethics, there's a book um, by Joseph Tulsa. In its Jewish yeah. ethics, and mm -hmm. it talks about—I don't know if it's Rabbi Akiva or uh, Akiva or what—but it talks about not ever humiliating right. a person, mm -hmm. and that's what I find like so great about Judaism is mm -hmm. that we are not supposed to bring shame upon right. you know, our anybody, family. right? Anyone, mm -hmm. anyone, and so that's one of the considerations. Like, you know, when you're keeping kosher, if someone—if that's all they have—they prepare, you know, pork for you because right. you know pork chop. That's all that, right. and for you to. You know, how do you handle that? Do you okay. Just say, well, so the difference would be is if you're a Jew or if you're not a Jew. Right. If you're a Jew, you go, ah, hell of free is over. I'm not eating the pork chop. Okay. I'll just not eat. Offend you or not offend you, I can't eat it. Okay. If you're a non-Jew, you go, mm, okay, I, I would really like to eat kosher, but God doesn't require me to not eat pork. He doesn't make that requirement on me as a non-Jew. But I've chosen to eat kosher. I've made a commitment to God that I was going to do it. I've weighed, I've, 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 I've measured this out, and this is why this next portion is so very important. That if you've made that decision, then you have to, as gently as you can, let them know, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't eat it. And, and, and the thing is, is what if you have kept kosher, like in my situation, I've kept kosher, and then I have fallen in and said, you know, what the heck, nothing is working for me, so right. I'm just going to indulge with everything. And I know it says that when you do, you know, that's death. Well, you know, and, and so yes, how do you but come back from that? okay. Well, you, first of all, you come back from it by repenting. But second of all, remember that we all fail. But what the what Rabbi Moshe Hamlazato is trying to say in this book is that is part of assessing whether that act that you're going to do is should be desirable, mm -hmm. right? Because if you put something on you that you fall so hard and become a disgrace to all of your friends and family. Mm -hmm. What good is that? What what is that done? So the best thing to do is to keep kosher as best as you can, as best you can as a non-Jew. Yeah, it's not required for you to have to eat kosher, but at the same time, it's 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 noble, and it's it's like you are practicing righteousness at the highest level, not even required of you. At the same time, make sure that it is you have calculated how you're going to do it, or your approach, how you're going to execute it, so that you don't cause more problems and discouragement for yourself. So this is going to answer this next thing. He says, how does one assess whether an act of piety is desirable? So how do I know I should eat kosher? Or how should I know if I'm a non-Jew eat kosher? How should I know if I'm a Jew that I should read 20 Psalms a day? How should I know? Is that something desirable? First of all, what one needs to recognize is this, that matters of chesedus must not be judged according to how they first appear. Rather, one must explore and consider how far the consequences of the planned actions extend. So it's not about, oh, wow, this looks good. I think I'll do this. But you need to say, okay, what, is, what are the implications down the road? If I make a restriction uh, up on myself to never touch another female in my life because I want to be at the highest level, what happens when my granddaughter is 18 years old and comes in and hasn't seen me in so long and wants to give her papa a hug. I have to think about the implications of that, right? Mm -hmm. and right now at five, it's not a big deal. So I have to think about those things. And that's important, yes. It's, um, we talked about that in 
come to the Hef Torah last night. Jephthah, Is it, yep, he didn't exactly. think that through. He didn't think it through. I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes through my door. <laughs> and it was his daughter. And he didn't think about the implication. He didn't even go as far as to think, okay, what would God accept as a sacrifice anyway? Why not just say, if you give me the battle, Hashem, I'm going to thank you because I will offer a sacrifice when I come back home. That would have been much more noble than spouting off something like that, right? So, it says, if, someone, if, some if for some times the action in itself appears to be virtuous, but since its consequences are bad, one uh, would be compelled to discard it. And should he take that action, he will be deemed a sinner and not a chesed, or righteous person. Here's an example of a pious, a pious conduct that lacked proper foresight as a result in calamity. For example, uh, the, inc uh, the incident of uh, Gedaliah. Uh, it says in uh, Jeremiah, the 40th chapter and 41st chapter, um, it says, because of Gedaliah's excessive piety due to which he made sure not to judge Ishmael, uh, Ishmael unfavorably and not to accept Lashon Hara about him or evil speech, he said that Yohanan bin uh, Karicha uh, says, you are speaking falsely about Ishmael, completely dismissing uh, Yohanan's report. And what did Gedalia cause through his ill-advised piety? He caused his own death, and he caused Israel to be scattered and the uh, remaining ember to be extinguished. So once again, another example to add the one from the Torah portion this week. He just didn't weigh the consequences of what he said. Spouted off, said the wrong thing. Now, the sages of blessed memory also say that Hold on a minute, let's go, I'm going to pass it. But here's an additional example. This comes from the Talmud. Uh, the second Beis HaGmikdash, too, was destroyed as a result of chesedus that was not judiciously weighed to determine it properly. Interesting thought. The Talmud says, regarding the incident of Bar Kamsa, who sought to incite the Roman government against the Jews. The sages related as follows. The sake of maintaining peaceful relationship with the Roman government, the majority of the sages wished to offer Caesar's animals as an, uh, on the altar, even though it was blemished and unfit. So the priest said, nah, to maintain peace. You know, a non-Jew can bring an offering, so we'll offer Caesar's animals, but they weren't the best. And they didn't want to tell him that. And so it says that Rav Afkola said to, to them, we cannot offer this animal as the people then will say that blemished animals were offered on the altar. The sages accepted this argument and considered killing the person who dissented, and so that he would be unable to report back to the Caesar that his offering had been rejected. But Rav Afkolos says to them, concealing the second idea, but then people will say that one, who, one whose blemishes created animals is put to death. Meanwhile, that evil man, Barkamsta, Barkamsta, went and slandered Israel, telling Caesar that the Jews refused to offer this because of their rebelliousness. And what ended up happening was Caesar became very angry at this whole thing and destroyed the Beis HaKmadash. A lesson gleaned from the two incidences that we just talked about, actually the three, is we have clear proof that with regard of Chesedus, one must not assess the action based solely on how it immediately manifests itself. How does it feel? it feel like a good thing to do? Sure, I would love to be able to do this. It seems like a great thing, but I need to look at the consequences. The Ramchal illustrates this idea that at times it is better to forego an, an apparent act of piety. Consider the Torah uh, com uh, commanded on uh, Vayakra 19.7. It says, you shall reprove your fellow if he behaves improperly. Yet numerous times 
a person will attempt to reprove sinners to take in a place or in a time when his words will clearly not be uh, heeded. We learned from the ethics of the fathers that one should not humiliate another. You don't point out the flaws of another person publicly. If a person asks for forgiveness, you make it easy for them to, to repent. We know that the Torah says to reprove a fellow. You need to reprove a brother. You need to correct them. But there is a method that you have to do that. Because if not, you'll be sinning while you're committing a mitzvah. You would be actually committing a sin by destroying another person by committing a, a mitzvah. I mean, that's kind of a hard thing to understand. But a pious person will say, yes, they need to be reproved. But the only time I ever meet them is publicly. One. Number two, I don't have that kind of relationship with them. And if I say something to them, it would humiliate them. So somehow I have to be clever enough to bring that to their attention. And I like that that uh, illustration was given of uh, the great sage walking down the road on Shabbos to Shul, and he sees a fellow Jew smoking a cigarette. And he says, you realize you're smoking on Shabbos? And the guy goes, uh, no, I, I didn't know it was Shabbos. I'm so sorry. Right? And finally he says, ah, I have to admit, I, I knew it was Shabbos. I can't lie to you, Rabbi. And Rabbi said, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, you, you didn't lie to me because a Jew wouldn't lie. He gave him a free pass. Gave him a total free pass. How, the, the Rabbi knew that he was violating the Shabbos, right? But at the same time, the guy admitted, I just lied to you. But he's going to say, a good Jew would never lie. You're not a liar. He just told me he wasn't a good Jew. <laughs> no, 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 no. He didn't say that. Well, but he didn't. He said it in such a way it wasn't to humiliate. It was to say, oh, you, I'm sure you made a mistake. You didn't know it was Shabbos. You should have still have concern about your help, though. <laughs> All right. I guess he could have, but, you know. There was, when, when the story about the ethics, it talked about um, the Rabbi Akio, he had a, about not humiliating mm -hmm. someone. He had a guest come over and um, it was on Shabbos and they had blessed the wine and they were drinking the wine and his guest accidentally uh, spilled the red wine mm -hmm. on his white tablecloth. Well, the rabbi hurried up and bumped his side and spilled his wine too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he so said, he's not embarrassed. Yeah, and he said, "Oh, he said, oh my gosh." His guest said, "Oh my gosh," you know, and he said, "No, it's the table. You know, it's, it's the leg on the table." That's I good. Fix it. That's really good. And so, you know, that's. Yeah, that's. Why that's really a good idea. I love about. The I know it's ethics is beautiful. So, let's look at this. Um, let's look at another situation. Let's see. Okay, we dealt with the whole reproof thing. Here's another example. Consider the following. It says, it is obvious, it is obviously appropriate for every person to eagerly run to a mitzvah matter. To do a mitzvah, you should run to do it and to endeavor to be among those who engage in it, and if not, first. However, sometimes a quarrel can result from this eagerness so that the mitzvah becomes more degraded and the name of Hashem is more desecrated through it than glorified. In such situation, the chesed is certainly obligated to forego the mitzvah and not pursue it, and the sages a blessed memory Concerning the, uh, the Leviim, specifically the children of Kehas, who were responsible for carrying the holiest vessels of the Mishkan during travel. This is a quotation in their language in Bemidbar Rabbah 5.1. He says, Why did Hashem command Aaron and his sons to assign each of the children of Kehas to specific, uh, the specific task in carrying the holy vessels? Because the children of Chehas knew that everyone would carry the uh, Aaron, uh, the ark, would merit great reward, and they, uh, and were they not given specific assignments, they would have abandoned uh, the shulchan, the menorah, and the altars, and instead everyone would want to want to carry the ark. So the idea is specific assignments. They laid it out properly because they knew everybody would want to carry the ark, and then no one would carry the menorah. So the idea was, is, is balance. Balance out the old thing. Um, here's another example. A person is obligated to observe all the mitzvahs which are of all spe specification regarding, uh, regardless of whose uh, presence he is in. 
He must not fear or be ashamed of anyone who may ridicule him. David Amelik says in Psalm 119, 46, you will speak to your, uh, I will speak of your testimonies before kings, and I will not be ashamed. David Amelik is basically saying, when I get around, hang around with all my king friends and politicians from other countries, they might sit around and talk about their Lamborghinis and their oil wells, but I'm, on, I'm going to talk about a show. You might not like it. Do what? No, you wouldn't have anybody to talk to. Exactly. So the whole point is, is uh, David Amelik was not embarrassed to have a monolithic view of life, and that is everything is about Hashem. Everything. Beautiful. So, um, he says, however, concerning this noble practice, uh, too, one requires discrimination and discernment. Obviously, you don't want to be around people who do, do everything but speak of Hashem. If anything, they probably desecrate the name of Hashem, and then you get up and sound like a Bible thumper. Yeah, you got to practice wisdom. For all, of, uh, for all of this, the one should serve Hashem without concern to people's opinion is said only regarding the actual mitzvahs that are required to perform as an absolute obligation. For example, if I know if you're a Jew and you have an obligation to eat kosher, you would not be caught dead eating in a non-kosher restaurant. You just won't do it. Just are n You're not going to do it. You're not going to be wearing a kippah and a tzitzit in a non-kosher restaurant. It's just not going to happen. And no, regardless of who that offends, it doesn't matter. This is an obligation I'm required to do. I'm required and you're required to, um, to not speak evil speech against another person. Yet if you're in the company of people who are doing that, it is not, um, it's, it's not a noble thing to ride along with it. Now, even though you didn't say anything, but you participated in the, the dialogue, that is a sin. And you shouldn't be worried about offending people by saying, I, I've had enough, I'm not dealing with this conversation. Because it's a righteous act, it's a mitzvah that is required to us by the law. However, certain additional matters of piety that are not required by law, which if a person performs them in the presence of a masses, and they will laugh at him and ridicule him, and thus they will be uh, rendering sinners and liable to punishment. So, things that are not required in Torah. Um, I don't know. Help me think. So something that's not required that you put as a restriction. Say, for example, uh, women, uh, women, women covering their hair. Um, it is required. But let's say for a non-Jew, for a woman to to cover her hair, uh, if she receives uh, criticism and people speak evil against Torah because of that, then in reality, though she's not sinning, she's inciting them to sin. Right? Make sense? I want you to make sure everybody's following. This is what he's talking about. So he's talking about if you're going to do a restriction that's not required, not an obligation to you, you've put that on yourself. And if people around you in public speak out evil against Hashem or the Torah because of what you're doing, just because they think it's stupid, you're causing them to sin. We don't want to cause another person to sin. I mean, we are, we are uh, prohibited from even allowing uh, an idol worshiper to utter the name of their deity. Did you know that? We're prohibited from, at, from, from getting them to do that. So if that's the case, if we don't even want an idol worshiper to sin, why would we want somebody... Uh, that, that is dear to us to sin. So you just back out of it and you don't do it. While, while one could refrain from performing these acts of piety they, as they are not absolute obligation, when it comes to the matter such as this, it is certainly more fitting for a chesed to forego the act than to do it. So it's just better not to do it than to cause problems. This too is included in what the scripture states in Micah 6, 8 says, and walk modestly with your God. Do not call attention to yourself through public displays of chesedus, but rather perform them in modest, concealed fashion. An example, it's not unusual to be in a very from Orthodox community and see a young 
yeshiva student uh, walking with a blinder on, you know, with a thing above his glasses, and he walks. He's just, he can only see a few feet in front of him. Why do you think he's doing that? Guarding his eyes so he doesn't see anything that's a sin and doesn't want to participate in. Well, that from guy could get away with it in a from community where everybody, you know, thinks, no, it's okay. But let's say this guy transplants, transplants and he's in Cincinnati. And he's walking down the street looking like a silly person and causing people to say, if that's Torah, pfft, I don't want that. Or even a non-practicing Jew go, if that's what religion is, I don't have anything to do with it. It's ridiculous. Hashem's crazy. If that's the case, it'd be better for him to take the blinders off and just not look. Guard his eyes without all the public display. It's very important. I thought there's some way that says you're not supposed to put blinders in front of your eyes. Well, this is talking about a different subject. It kind of reminds me of uh, street corner preachers. Right. They're, they're just ridiculed and mm -hmm. actually does, does nothing. Not, yeah, does nothing. Yeah. yeah. All right, does what nothing is, to, to do good. What is really like, um, sometimes like we're not putting, you know, a stumbling block in front of someone else. I know sometimes when um, I try to like keep kosher and then someone has reminded me, well, such and such, like a great person, like a, a righteous Jew, they'll point out, well, that righteous Jew that eats shrimp or whatever you right, know, but 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 it, but, but your response should be they're not a righteous Jew mm -hmm. well my response has been you know well they shouldn't be doing that and even if they don't keep kosher they shouldn't do right now if they say well I know Jews who don't who eat shrimp you go that's fine that's great but they're they're not a practicing Jew period they're not doing what scripture says I mean I mean there's no there's nothing wrong. see I guess the point is this obviously we don't want to be um, obstinate, uh, obnoxious human beings. Uh, that's not, that doesn't bring any goodness to, to, to heaven. Conversely, someone who tries to ridicule your piety mm -hmm. by pointing out the lack of piety in other people who claim to be Jews, call it what it is. Call it what it is. Because it's just, it's, 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 mm -hmm disingenuous it, it lacks intellectual honesty for a person because they don't first of all they don't know they think well well this person's a Jew and they eat pork and you know I see them all the time you know they don't wear keep out and whatever you just need to let them know I'm not trying to be like them I'm trying to do what the scripture says it's a big difference yeah very good point though so Indeed, many of the great Hasidim refrain from engaging in their practices of Hasidus while among masses because it would have appeared pretentious, which is another thing that if a person truly has a pure heart, he doesn't want people to think that they're doing it to bring attention to themselves. They're very humble about it. The sum of the matter is this. Anything that is integral to the performance of a mitzvah, one should perform uh, uh, I'm sorry, one should perform in the face of mockery. That is, if, you, if you're obligated, then it's all right. You do it to the point even of mockery. But if it is not integral and you're not obligated to the mitzvah, and if it is done in public will provoke uh, derision and, and cynicism, one should not do it. The Ramchal sums up the matter of weighing chesedus by this. You thus learn from all these examples that one who wishes to conduct himself with true chesedus must evaluate all of his actions in light of the ramifications that will emerge from them and according to the circumstances that attend, attend them. Namely, one must evaluate the intention, uh, the intended action according to the time in which he plans to act according to the social environment and according to the subject and according to the place in which he plans to act. And if, uh, des if desisting from, this, uh, from the action will generate more sanctification of the name of Hashem and more sanctification before Him uh, than the action, then He should desist and not act. In the Haredi community in Jerusalem, on Shabbos, it is not unusual to see an Arab taxi drive through the neighborhood in which there's, nobody, there's no cars driving in the, in the area. And you will see a Haredi 
uh, Jew pick up a bottle, a, a crate, you name it, and throw it at the car and go, that's your ass, and screaming and hollering. I understand the outrage, okay? I understand why he does that. But what do you think that Arab is thinking when he's driving down the street? Laughing, he's, just he's a nutcase. Well, but he put a stumbling block in front of the Jew. But, in, in no, 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 that's not the case. No, 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 not, no he's, how is he putting a stumbling block in front of the Jew? The Jew's not going to go get in a taxi. I'm going to drive a taxi now because I saw the Muslim. What he's doing is, no, no, it's, the Jew is, the, that's exactly it. The Jew was putting the stumbling block in front of the Arab guy who's driving down the road, and then anybody else, say, for example, a tourist that's there, let's say a, not, a secular Jew, in the, a tourist, walking through the area and sees that and goes, ugh, jeez. If that's what religion is about, I don't want to add, that guy's bitter. All right? He's not angry and bitter. He just is trying to tell the guy, don't drive through the neighborhood. So the point is, very good point, is that guy should forego that level of piety for the sake of what's going on. Now, Let's say that nobody is around, and only he and the cab driver is there. Should he de decease and not do that? I would say it depends. It really depends on the, I don't think he's trying to impress or worry about the cab driver, but his people around, what are they going to say about his Judaism? I think it's a pious thing to defend Hashem. We know that. We know defending Torah is a, is a wonderful, pious thing. But at the same time, in defending Torah, I end up causing people to curse Torah. It's not benefited. It's, I've not benefited heaven. But what if that taxi driver was another Jew? That's a different story. It's, yeah, it's a different story. I mean, that's just... Once, 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 once again, once again, it's about how do, you, how do you reprove a brother or a fellow and yet do it without humiliation? That's the hard one. Sometimes the obvious escapes me just mm -hmm. because of the way my brain is wired. So, I don't understand. So, if, you know, because there's no driving in, in Orthodox. Um, so, how, to me, he's the, the Arab is causing the Jew to be angry? No, it doesn't matter. It, no, it, that but doesn't matter. Anger is, would be a good thing, what you're saying, because it's defending right. Shem. Right, right. But it doesn't, you see, the thing is this. A righteous person or a pious person or Orthodox, religious Jew, is defending the fact that it's Shabbos. So, so but the Arab is not obligated, according to Torah, to not drive on the Shabbos. He's not obligated. So why scream at that guy who has not obligated, he's not required to do it. There isn't a law in Israel that says you, you cannot drive a taxi on Shabbos. He's not breaking the law. So why go to all of this outrage only to make your Judaism look silly? Mm -hmm. That's the point. And the Ramchal would say, ah, back off a little bit. Just back off. Back off and not be angry, or back off and not... Not, not act so crazy. Throwing stuff at a car is not going to accomplish anything. It doesn't keep the guy from driving down the street. All you're going to do is get people that are not religious to go, ugh. They'll think it's disgusting. See, I think I've been it's very possible. Very possible. We can talk about it uh, after class. Let me conclude, because we need to wrap this up. Ramchal concludes with the remarkable illustration of the need to consider all the possible angles of an act before adopting it as a chesedus. So, it says, lastly, the incident of Rav Tarfan, found in Brachos 10b, will prove that an act of piety must be taken at its face value. And related to the Mishnah, Rav uh, Tarfon says, uh, was uh, stringent to lean on his side for the recitation of the nighttime Shema in accordance to the opinion of Beis Shem, uh, Shemai, Shemani. Uh, it says, once Rav Tarfon was traveling, and in order to comply with his stringency, he dismounted his donkey and left himself open to attack by bandits. The sages said to him, had those bandits attack you, it would have been fitting for you to come to harm, for you uh, contrive the words of Beis Hillel to permit, uh, to permit the Shema to be recited in that position. So basically, the sages were saying, if you would have been attacked, you got off your, your horse in the worst possible place that you could do it, you probably deserved it, because God didn't require that of you. You were being foolish. So that concludes chapter 20.